Amen. Well, listen, today uh, we're going to go ahead and dive into the Word of God. Um, as I was writing this uh, message, um, I came to the realization that this thing is <laughs> it's getting too long. It was, it was getting very, very long, very long. And so I decided to break it up into two parts. So we'll finish uh, prayerfully, Lord willing, the next part next week. So I'm going to give you just one point today. And then I'll give you the next two points next week. Amen. Uh, but we'll do it like that. So if you have your Bible, if you would turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 22. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 22. And let us stand for the reading of God's word. 1 Samuel. First Samuel chapter 22. Starting at verse number one. It says, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them. And there were about 400 men with him. Verse, uh, verse number five. Uh, now the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold. Depart, go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Today I want to talk for a few moments from this subject. Don't cave under pressure. Don't cave under pressure. And there's a play on words there. Uh, David is in a cave, but don't cave under pressure. I knew y'all was going to catch it, amen. Uh, don't cave under pressure. In America, there is a popular idiom called to cave or to cave in. Uh, this idiom literally means to give up under pressure. It means to stop fighting, to stop resisting when the pressure seems to be too great. For example, there are times when the constant complaining of a child will cause some parent to cave in and give the child what they want. Because to cave in means to surrender. It means to give up. It means to stop resisting. And I bring this up, ladies and gentlemen, because most of us are no strangers to pressure. Some of you have experienced pressure in your finances where you find yourself struggling to pay for the basic necessities of life. Some of you have experienced pressure in your marriage where you want to make it work, but every time your relationship takes one step forward, it seems like it gets knocked two steps backward. Uh, some of you have experienced pressure at your job where you struggle to meet unrealistic deadlines and performance goals, and securing a meaningful raise is nearly impossible. But and if you're not careful, you will find yourself caving under the pressures of life. And now you're talking to a therapist instead of talking to God. Now you're on Facebook having, instead of having your face in the book. Now you're grooving at the club, but you've gone missing from the church. And I bring this up because I wonder how many people have gone into depression, have experienced a nervous breakdown, have dealt with a midlife crisis because the pressures of life were weighing them down. It's important to understand that as believers... We have an adversary named Satan, and he wants us to cave under the pressures of life. And oftentimes, he will send trials and tribulations our way with the hopes of weakening our faith. He'll send trials our way with the hope of derailing our calling from God, with the hope of hindering our fellowship with God. You see, the devil knows that he can't steal your salvation. Why? Because if you're a believer in Jesus, you are eternally secure in him. You are held firmly in the hand of God, and nothing can snatch you from his hand. So the devil knows he can't steal your salvation, but he also knows that he can hinder your testimony. Therefore, he'll send problems, pressures, and predicaments in your life in order to discourage you and cause you to doubt the power of God. You see, the enemy would love nothing more than for you to walk in doubt and discouragement because he's hoping that it will cause you to stop inviting people to church. 
He's hoping that it will cause you to stop being concerned about God's kingdom agenda. He's hoping that it will cause you to exercise your right to remain silent and stop telling people about how good God is being in your life. I mean, let's be honest, some people would never pick up a Bible. They would never grab an NIV, a New International Version. They will never grab a KJV, a King James Version, or NLT, a New Living Translation. But they will grab Y-O-U. Yeah, they will look at the U version. As a matter of fact, you are the Bible that you are the only Bible that some people will ever read. You are the only scripture that some people will ever examine. And they'll look at your life and see how you respond to trials and tribulations. And if you respond the same way they would, they don't see a need to try Jesus. You see, it's my belief that Christians should have the best attitude when it comes to handling bad news. And let's be honest, none of us in here wants to receive bad news. No one wants to hear the doctor say we found something. No one wants to hear the CEO say we're cutting jobs next month. No one wants to hear the principal say your child has been expelled from this school. No one wants to hear their spouse say, I don't want to be with you any longer. But the unfortunate reality is that no matter how holy and righteous you try to live, bad news is just one house down from ours. Listen, when we find ourselves face to face with troubles, we don't have to weep like those who have no hope. And that's because we serve a God who knows how to show up in our storms. And I'm a witness that if we cry out to him in prayer, he has the power to say, peace be still and change our raging storm into radiant sunshine. But here's the good news. Even if he doesn't give us any external peace by pulling us out of our situation, he can give us an internal peace by allowing us to rejoice in the midst of our situation. And I wonder if there's anybody in here that's ever gone through a crisis in life and yet God gave you an internal peace and it almost scared you because you thought to yourself I shouldn't be I should be feeling worse than this but even in the midst of my trouble God still put a smile on my face even in the midst of my trouble God put a song of praise in my heart even in the midst of my trouble God put a positive outlook in my mind and that's why when we go through a difficult season in life we don't turn to crown royal We don't turn to Calgon baths. We don't turn to romantic rendezvous as a means of escape. Instead, we turn to Jesus. Why? Because he is the one who is able to work all things together for our good. Listen, as we, as we, all of us will encounter hardships and trouble, but in the midst of our ordeal, we ought to refuse to cave in. We ought to refuse to give in under the pressures of the enemy. As we look here in 1 Samuel chapter 22, we see a man named David. And David was well acquainted with pressure. He's the youngest son of his father, Jesse. And in chapter 16, the prophet Samuel goes to the house of Jesse. And he anoints David to be the next king of Israel. Y'all, that's pressure. In chapter 17, David, this teenage shepherd, successfully fights and kills the Philistine giant named Goliath. That's pressure. And after the defeat of Goliath, David became sort of a national hero. He became such a celebrity that a song was written about him that everybody was singing and dancing to. And in the hook of the song, it says something It says something like this. It says, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. That's what the song said. It said, Saul has slain his thousands and made David his tens of thousands. And I just wondered to myself, what would that sound like if it was if it was put to music? I mean, if it was put to music, what would it sound like? And and maybe it would sound like this. Uh, Let me catch the vibes. All right. So maybe something like this. Saul slain the thousands. David is tens of thousands. Saul slain the thousands. David is tens of thousands. Saul slain the thousands. David is tens of thousands. David is tens of thousands. David is tens of thousands. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe that that's y'all. No, this was a this was a popular song that was out there. If it if it had happened today, it would be all over TikTok. It would be it would be a video for it and everything. 
And y'all, this song infuriated King Saul so much that in a jealous rage, he sought to kill David on multiple occasions. I mean, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 11, Saul tried to kill David with a spear. 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 11, Saul tries a second time to kill David with a spear. In 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 15, Saul sent his servants to have David killed. And I find it interesting that after each of these assassination attempts, David was able to escape. As a matter of fact, verse 1 says David escaped to the cave. Let me say this, the reason why you don't have to cave under pressure is because if you look back over your life, you will see where God allowed you to escape some stuff. Some of you escaped poverty and lack. Some of you escaped a violent upbringing. Some of you escaped a high crime neighborhood. Some of you escaped drug addiction. Some of you escaped a terrible, toxic, and traumatic relationship. And you didn't escape it because of how good you were. You didn't escape it because how often you came to church. But you escaped it because of the grace and mercy of God that was on your life. If it was up to the enemy, you would have died a long time ago. During the storm, the tree would have fell on your house. During the shootout, the stray bullet would have taken you down. During the blizzard, your car would have slid into oncoming traffic. But how many of you know that the reason you're still here is because God allowed you to escape? And I wonder, do I have any escapees in the room who know that the only reason you are here this morning is because of the grace and mercy of God that was on your life? As we look at chapter 22, verse 1, we find David is on the run from King Saul. And he's perhaps the most wanted person in all of Israel. He's literally gone from hero to zero. Things had gotten so bad for him that he lost his wife, McCall. He lost his job as captain in Saul's army. He lost connection with his best friend, Jonathan. He lost his ability to worship God freely at the temple. No doubt Saul had a soldier stationed everywhere waiting for David to come out of hiding. Y'all, it almost seems as if David has lost everything. But the reason he didn't slit his wrist, the reason he didn't jump off a bridge is because in spite of what he lost, he remembered he still had God. Listen, I'm here to let somebody know don't trip off of what you lost. Yes, you lost the relationship. Yes, you lost the car. Yes, you lost the job. Yes, you lost the close friend. But in spite of what you lost, you can rejoice in the fact that you still have God. And as long as you've got God, how many of you know he can restore back to you everything that the enemy stole from you? Y'all, David's situation was dire. But in the midst of that, he finds himself in the right place. I know he finds himself in the right place because he finds himself in a cave. And not just any cave, but according to one, this is called the cave of Adullam. This is significant because the word Adullam in the Hebrew language means, uh, means refuge. The word uh, Adullam, is a, uh, the word refuge is a military term which denotes a place of safety and security from the enemy. In a real sense, David is on the run, but he ends up in a place of refuge. He ends up in a place of safety and security. And maybe you're asking yourself, where is our place of refuge today? Where is that place that we can turn to when the enemy is on our trail? Trail. Where can we turn to when troubles seem too hard for us to bear? I'm glad you asked. The answer is found in Psalm 46 and 1. Psalm 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Y'all, I love this verse because it lets me know that God is my adulam. He's my place of refuge. As a matter of fact, when I'm going through a storm in life, I don't have to face it on my own. I don't have to run to a cave. I can now run to Christ. I don't have to run to a adulam. I can now run to the Almighty. You see, the reason why so many people get stuck in their problem is because they run to the wrong people and they run to the wrong things. Some of them run to the 
bottle, some run to the casino, some run to the gentleman's club, some run to Las Vegas, talking about what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But if you're a child of God, nothing should even be going down in Vegas like that. All that running will only provide you with a temporary relief. But after your high wears off, after the club is closed, after you've gambled all your money away, you still have to deal with the reality of your problems. But I'm here to let you know that when you run to God in prayer, he'll provide you with everything you need in order to make it through your ordeal. And the good news is that if you are his child, he will take care of you. And he'll take care of you not till you turn 18. He'll take care of you not till you turn 25. But he'll take care of you for the rest of your life. How do I know? In Psalm 26 and 3, David says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. How long? All the days of my life. In Psalm 30 and 5, the psalmist said God's anger is for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Oh, I don't know about you, but I thank God that his favor is for life. In other words, there's no expiration date on his favor. There's no statute of limitation on his favor. There's no end date on his favor. All you've got to do is wake up in the morning, have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about your trouble, and he'll hear your faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. Why? Because his favor lasts for a lifetime. And it's important that you know this because if you know that his favor is for life, you can have hope in the midst of life storms. You know, there's one thing I've discovered about storms. Uh, there's one thing that every storm has in common. I don't care what kind of storm it is. I don't care if it's a thunderstorm. I don't care if it's a hurricane, a typhoon. I don't care if it's a tornado. There's one thing that all storms have in common. You know what that is? It's that eventually they end. There is no storm that started 20 years ago that's still going on today. Eventually, every storm ends. And that's a word for somebody this morning because the devil wants you to think that the storm you are facing has no end date. But God told me to let you know that the storm you're going through eventually is going to come to an end. You know, we had a person in our membership and they were dealing with cancer. I don't, want, know if, I don't know if I want to share the name yet, but I'm really excited about it. They were dealing with cancer, and we've been praying for that for a number of years uh, about their cancer situation. But just this week, we found out that their cancer went into remission. Oh, somebody ought to get happy about that. One of our, one of our prominent members. Because... Somebody in here needs to know that God has an end date to your storm. Your storm is not going to last forever. Trouble don't last always. God has an expiration date on your storm. Y'all, David ran to a cave. He ran to this place of refuge. And what I like about David is that he didn't allow his problems to cause him to cave in, to quit, or to give up. Rather, he learned a valuable lesson while in that cave. And the first lesson that he learned, if you're taking notes, this is my only point for the morning. So if you don't catch this, you missed it. Here's my first point. Problems serve a purpose. Problems serve a purpose. Look at verse number two. Watch what it says. It says, and everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. Watch this. So he became captain over them. And there were about 400 men with him. Listen, everything that you're going through, every problem, every issue, every drama is either God ordained or God allowed. There is nothing that the devil can do to you that God has not first signed off on. And he allows problem to hit our lives for three reasons. First, our problems are designed to direct us. Somebody say direct us. Sometimes it takes God allowing a painful event to happen in our lives in order for us to clearly see the purpose that he has for us. In 
Acts chapter 8, verse 1. God had to allow persecution to hit the Christian community in order to move them from the comfort of Jerusalem and into various parts of the world because he knew that if they didn't experience this problem, his purpose would not be fulfilled in their life. Listen, sometimes God has to allow you to experience trouble in order to move you into your purpose. He may have to allow you to experience a job loss to move you into full-time ministry. He may have to allow you to, uh, he may have to allow some person to walk out of your life so he can bring the right person into your life. He may have to allow you to go broke so that when you recover all, you can write a book helping people gain financial freedom. Listen, God has a way of using our problems in order to direct us toward the purpose that he has designed for our life. God had a purpose for David, and he used King Saul to push him to this cave. Why? Because God knew that David's purpose was to be king of Israel. But in order for him to successfully lead people on a large scale, he needed to learn how to lead people on a small scale. So God sends David into a cave, and he gives him 400 men who are all dealing with issues. And the Bible says that David was made captain over them. Don't miss this. David was anointed. He was called to lead millions. But at this time, God had given him a few hundred to lead. Perhaps it's because God wanted to test the humility of David. You see, it was King Saul's arrogance and pride that eventually led to his downfall as king. And perhaps God wanted to make sure that David is humble enough to serve at a small level as he waits for God to elevate him to a higher level. David passed this test, but the sad reality is that many believers don't. You see, there are believers right now who are anointed to teach. But they think teaching kids is beneath them. They wouldn't be caught dead teaching a teen class. And God says, if you're faithful over a few things, I'll elevate you and put you in charge over many things. Y'all, that is a divine principle that we would do well to remember. But perhaps God is not testing David's humility. Maybe his desire is to develop David's leadership ability. So he starts him off small in order to allow him to work his way up. No wonder the Bible says, despise not the day of small beginnings. David, God may have anointed you to be king, but don't despise being made captain over 400. God may have anointed you, somebody in here, to be a CEO, but don't despise working at an entry-level position. God may have anointed you to be a regional vice president, but don't despise working as a shift supervisor. God may have anointed you to be a professional athlete, but don't despise going to the minor league and working your tail off. You've got to walk before you crawl. You've got to crawl before you ball. If you put in the time, effort, and energy, the Bible says your gift will make room for you. Y'all, David was in trouble. But that trouble actually served to train him for the purpose that God had for his life. Listen, sometimes God will use your present trouble to train you for the destiny that he has for you. That's why sometimes you ought to say, Lord, I thank you for the trial. I don't know why it's happening to me. But you said in your word that no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. I don't know why it's happening to me, but you said in your word that you'll supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. You said in your word, I can cast my cares upon you for you care for me. And that's a word for somebody this morning that no matter what you're going through, you don't have to carry that problem with you. You don't have to carry it to work with you. You don't have to carry it to school with you. You don't have to carry it back home with you. You can take your burdens to the Lord and you can leave them with him. Listen, not only do our problems direct us, but secondly, our problems inspect us. Somebody say inspect us. You see, some of you say you love God. You say that you are a ride or die disciple, but let some problem come in your life and you'll become so angry, frustrated and bitter with God that you'll come to church but you won't say amen. You'll grab the offering basket, but you won't put nothing in it. You'll go to Facebook and like everybody else's pictures, 
like the picture of your neighbor's cat and all that, but you won't like nothing that Second Baptist Post. Why? Because your bitterness has caused you to believe that God has stopped blessing you. And God has not stopped blessing you. He's just inspecting you. He's inspecting your faithfulness and commitment to him because he wants to see if trouble will push you away from him or if trouble will get, bring you closer to him. Listen, somebody ought to made up in their mind that even though problems may come, I'm still going to pray without ceasing. That even though problems may come, I'm still going to serve the Lord with gladness. That even though problems may come, I'm still going to magnify the name of the Lord. I refuse to abandon ship when the waves of life seem to be overtaking me because I've decided that I will trust in the Lord until I die. Here's what I'm discovering. I'm discovering that people are like tea bags. You want to know what's inside of them? Drop them in a hot water. Listen, when, when God drops you in a hot situation, I wonder what comes out of you. Does fear or faith come out of you? Does worry or worship come out of you? Does complaining or confidence come out of you? What comes out of you when God puts you in a hot situation? Bible, there was a man named Job who suffered greatly. He lost everything, lost his health. He had painful sores all over his body, lost his children. They were killed in a natural disaster, lost his wealth and livestock. Even his wife said, man, you ought to curse God and die. Yet even in the midst of Job's pain, he had faith to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Even in the midst of what he was going through, he had enough faith to say, though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. Hear me clearly. God is looking for some people who will trust him in the midst of their trial. If you trusted him when all your bills were paid, if you trusted him when your husband was acting right, if you trusted him when you received those bonus checks, then you ought to still trust him when all hell is breaking loose in your life because you understand this. A rainbow always comes after rain falls. And I know it may be raining your life right now, but if you hold on, God can turn your mess into a masterpiece. God can turn your troubles into triumph. God can turn your disaster into deliverance. Is there anybody that knows that we serve a God who can turn your situation around? Yes, he can. Somebody just shout, he can turn it around. Oh, yeah, you got to say it to yourself. Somebody say, he can turn it around. Listen, not only do our problems direct us, not only do our problems inspect us, but lastly, they correct us. You see, the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Sometimes God will send problems into our life in order to cause us to get right with him. The psalmist understood this when he said in Psalm 119, verse 71, he said, it was good for me that I have been afflicted that I may learn your statues. Watch this. The psalmist is admitting that if he had not been afflicted, if trouble had not have entered the narrative of his life, then he would still be, he wouldn't have been thinking about the Bible. But he came to the realization that it was divine affliction that caused him to develop divine affection. You see, I'm convinced that there are people right now that know that God had to allow problems to hit their life in order that they may turn to him for help. He had to allow sickness to hit their body. He had to allow trouble to come into their life. He had to allow unemployment to come knocking on their door. And he allowed it to get their attention and cause them to seek after him once again. Because if you truly belong to God, he will not allow you to drift but so far before he allows some trial to bring you back to himself. And I can testify that sometimes God allowed trials to come into my life in order to get me to pray more. Sometimes God allowed trials to come into my life in order to get me to live better. Sometimes God allowed trials to come into my life in order to cause me to read the Bible more diligently because he loved me too much to allow me to wear his name but not walk in his ways. I'm done, but I'm glad that God doesn't allow trials to cause us to collapse under pressure. I've discovered that you can go through the same trial that somebody else went through. They swallowed a bottle of pills, but you sought the Lord in prayer. 
You can go through the same trial somebody else went through, and they pulled away from God. But you draw near to God. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. And the Holy Spirit in you has a way of stabilizing you under pressure. You know, um, I find it interesting that submarines, uh, people who are in the Navy and they go on subs, they spend a lot of time underwater. And those subs can go very, very deep down, just hundreds of meters down in the water. And those submarines don't collapse. Anything else you put down there, it is going to collapse under the weight and pressure of the water. But those submarines, they can go for days and days under all of that pressure. And the reason that they can stay under pressure like that and not collapse is because they, those submarines have been pressurized on the inside. In other words, the pressure inside the sub is equal to the pressure outside of the sub. And so it causes those soldiers to remain alive in that, in that submarine doesn't collapse because of what, what has happened on the inside of the submarine. And I bring this up because if you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and he is able to co- keep you from collapsing under the weight of your trial. And that's why you can go through one trial after the next and you can still come to church and shout amen you can go through one trial after the next come to church and still wave your hand you can go through one trial after the next come to church and give God the praise and glory that he deserves because there's something on the inside of you that stabilizes you under pressure no wonder the Bible says now under him who was able to keep you from falling is there anybody who knows that God can keep you from falling he he can keep you in your right mind. He can keep you from going back to old habits. He can keep you from falling away from the faith. He can keep you from falling into a permanent state of depression. We serve a God who is able to keep you. But you have to be willing. You have to be willing to trust him and don't turn away from him. Amen. So as we, as we, amen. So we, we, we can be in a cave. But we don't have to cave in under the pressures of life. The enemy wants you to cave in. The enemy wants you to give up. He wants you to turn away. He wants you to say enough is enough. There are some people right now, they stop coming to church. They stop being involved in the life of the church because problems have driven them away. But God told me to let you know that problems are not there to drive you away. They're there to draw you closer. They're there to draw you closer. Sometimes I run into people at Walmart, Crocker Barrel. I missed you. I ain't seen you in church in a long, a long time. Same story. Well, Pastor, I'm going through a storm right now. I'm going through a difficult season. Well, guess what? You ain't going to come out of that being in isolation. God may have allowed that storm to happen in your life, not to draw you away from him, but to draw you closer to him. That's my word for somebody today. Don't allow your your pressure to draw you away. Allow it to draw you closer.